Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Most people probably don't realize this, but Ecuador is home to the largest oil spill in history. Between 1964 and 1992, the oil company Texaco, now owned by Chevron, admitted to having dumped 16 billion gallons of oil in Ecuador's Amazon region of Lago Agrio. This is 80 times more than oil than BP's Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Following a favorable judgment for the affected communities in Ecuador, the case is still being litigated in courts in Canada, Argentina, and Brazil. But how did it come to this enormous amount of oil dumping? The explanation is usually relatively simple. Oil companies and similar corporations save money by contaminating the environment. A recent study, though, conducted in the context of the Texaco Chevron case, adds a new twist to this explanation. The argument is that oil companies have an incentive to contaminate the environment that goes beyond saving money. That is, it allows them to make even more money. Joining me here in person is the author of this study, Lindsay Ofrias. Lindsay is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Princeton University. Her research focuses on environmental justice, petropolitics, and social movements. Her article, Invisible Harms, Invisible Profits, A Theory of the Incentive to Contaminate, came out in the August issue of Culture Theory and Critique. Thanks for being here, Lindsay. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, let's take a look at a moment at the specific case that you examined, the Texaco Chevron oil dumping case in Lago Agrio. First of all, how has this oil dump affected the communities there? Yeah, so um, what's interesting about this case that's different from most other oil spills is that it wasn't a spill. It wasn't that technology failed. It was that the corporation decided that it could save money by not following the proper protocol of what to do with the wastes. So um, instead of re-injecting the production waste back into the ground, which was standard, they left it in these big open pits, not even lined. And because these uh, contaminants are in these big pits, they leak into the water, into the soil, and this affects everything that people are consuming. And so we can imagine that if you're consuming petrochemicals chem and uh, all kinds of heavy metals like lead and mercury, these are associated with cancer, leukemia, uh, skin disease, birth defects, and um, yeah, there's really no way to escape it. I've spoken with the, the doctor in the local area who's seen everything, and he says that it's very disheartening for him as a doctor because there's so little he can do. He says if somebody is sick from smoking cigarettes and has lung cancer, you can at least say, well, please, maybe you shouldn't smoke right now. But he can't really say anything to people who he works with because what is he going to say? Don't eat your food, don't drink this water. What specifically did Texaco gain from dumping so much oil in Ecuador? Well, what's very interesting is that the judge in Ecuador that ruled against the corporation said that the company saved about $3 per barrel of oil uh, by not using the proper technologies of uh, expo disposing of the oil waste. And um, this, there was a lot of third-party expert studies that made these calculations. And um, that's particularly what I find very fascinating, though, is the idea was that the company was, the intention of the company was to save money, not to harm the local people. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find the gap to be very uh, important to point out, is that the people who are actually experiencing the contamination, they experience it as a violence that has some intention behind it to cause harm. Because when there's some foresight that this could potentially cause harm, then how can it not be considered in some way intentional? At least that's what it feels like subjectively to be experiencing that. Okay, the Ecuadorian lawyers asked the International Criminal Court to look at the CEOs and the executives' behaviors of Chevron as, a, as committing a crime against humanity. And we often don't think in terms of criminality when we deal with toxic cases like this, because the idea is to take the burden off of the affected people and to say it doesn't matter if a corporation or a state actor intended to cause harm. What matters is that they've sickened these communities. But while that does help take a burden of proof off of the affected communities, it also forecloses asking questions about criminality. And it forecloses um, questions such as what makes this kind of 
petroviolence different from chemical warfare? So, but then what did they, uh, what, what was the, um, the advantage that uh, Texaco had, aside from the fact that they saved $3, was there anything, any other advantage they had from uh, dumping this oil? Well, what I'm looking at in my study is to do a, a longer term study because the way that toxicity develops over time, it, the harms of that toxicity, as well as the profits that it procures for the oil industry as a whole, not necessarily one corporation, but the oil enterprise, that becomes very difficult to see because of the way it happens over time. So by there being contamination in this area, it creates a certain dependency on the local community, on the oil enterprise. So I would meet so many people who had been living in the area, fishing, farming, uh, you know, basic sustainable or subsistence-based living, and they can no longer live off the land that way. Mm -hmm. And so what happens? They end up working for the very same industry that they believe destroyed their way of life. And not necessarily out of choice, but because there's literally no other way to survive. So by there being so much contamination in this area, it makes it so much easier for the oil industry to expand its power. Hmm. And so what you'll see is people who were uh, very against oil development, I mean, fierce activists that say, we do not want any oil development in this area, they're now conceding to expansion of the oil frontier because they can no longer live off the land like they did in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, let's dive into the heart of your argument. I mean, we, like you mentioned, we, the, the oil company saves money by polluting, basically. Um, and, you know, in economic jargon, we usually refer to this as the externalization of costs because other people will take care of the cleanup or the, the damage uh, and they don't need to clean up themselves. So, but how is your argument about the incentive to contaminate different from this usual explanation then? Yeah, so there's a few different ways of explaining the pervasiveness of the problem. So, and you've mentioned uh, most of them, and I'll just re-summarize, which is that it's cheaper to clean up a spill than prevent it. At least it looks that way on the surface. And that is shaped by us not having very good environmental regulations or great enforcement of the regulations that do exist. And also that it's easier to get away with uh, taking those kinds of risks among marginalized communities such as in the Ecuadorian Amazon or in the Gulf of Mexico. And then the fourth explanation, which is these are all tied together, but a more radical Marxist critique would say that even if you as a corporation or a corporate actor or even a state actor wanted to be ethical and wanted to treat the community in which you worked with respect, you actually have very little opportunity because profit really depends on destroying the environmental conditions. So um, most political economists, including Marxist political economists, treat contamination like collateral damage. None of us really intend to create damage. It just kind of happens when we're trying to pursue profit. And uh, this creates a really big problem or challenge, I would say, for um, dealing with environmental crimes on the international scale because the only international body to deal with environmental crimes or any kind of international crime is the International Criminal Court. And they only have historically dealt with environmental crimes in the wartime context. And so to think of something as a war, there needs to be an intention to cause harm. And since we're seeing contamination as collateral damage and not as an intention to cause harm, there's actually no international legal framework in which to deal with a case like the Chevron case. Um, so what I'm proposing from, from my work, I'm not necessarily, while there might be enough evidence to say that there is intention behind uh, these kinds of contamination, uh, disasters. I want to put more attention to the productive work that contamination does for consolidating oil industry power. So one of the arguments that the Ecuadorian lawyers have been making to the International Criminal Court is saying that Chevron's refusal to clean this up represents a crime against humanity, almost like 
uh, an indirect attack on a population like apartheid in South Africa. But they haven't been successful in making <laughs> this case. Uh, so now there's a move to create a new uh, framework, a new legal framework under the category of ecocide, where you don't necessarily have to prove intention, but to prove uh, just that the effects are almost like chemical warfare. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how does that then relate to this incentive to co contaminate? I mean, how, how is that uh, constitute? I mean, what, what, what is the incentive there? Um, aside, like I said before, about the um, uh, saving money. Mm -hmm. Whether or not people are consciously acting on this incentive, there is an incentive scheme in place, which is that when there is contamination, you have more control over a population that is already resistant to your activity. So most of these corporations and state actors look at people in these areas as being in the way of extractive activity. So in the northern Ecuadorian Amazon and also in the southern Ecuadorian Amazon, there's a very, very strong political movement saying that's against oil development uh, almost wholeheartedly, but um, uh, once there is this contamination, there is, it demobilizes that resistance because now people depend on the petrodollar to survive. And it also can concentrate people, uh, make them leave particular areas to, in order to look for cleaner water, cleaner air, and, and cleaner land. In your article, you also mentioned um, or related to fracking, um, and uh, and you've done a little bit of work in that area as well. What, uh, how, how does this affect or how does this apply to to the situation of fracking? Yeah, great question. Because I also wanted to bring up that it's not just about controlling populations, but also opening new opportunities for investment. And some people have already written about that, like Naomi Klein has talked a bit about that in terms of the money that can be made through cleanup as its own industry. So the fracking case is fascinating and particularly disturbing because they, the, same, the very same companies that are polluting our water through fracking, they're also buying up the water rights because they need a lot of water to be able to frack. It's just part of the production process. But then they're saying, don't worry, whatever we do to your water, we will remediate it for you. But it costs so much money to remediate it. And we are the sole uh, brilliant people who have the technology in which to do that. So what used to be a commons, and you used to not pay that much at all for your water, it almost it was free, almost given to you by your, your local uh, municipality. Now you're going to have to be paying 100, 1,000 times more than what you're used to paying for oil because of the high cost of remediating it. So they're pretending like they are creating some kind of solution, but in fact, they're enclosing our water and then selling it back to us at a higher price than what we used to pay for it. And that's something that Food and Water Watch has been monitoring very closely. And uh, finally, another case, uh, which is perhaps the biggest one that's on a lot of people's minds, obviously, is uh, the situation of uh, climate change. Do you see an incentive to contaminate or to warm the globe in this context? I absolutely do. And there's been a lot of research showing how the melting of the polar ice caps is opening up new oil fields that uh, companies couldn't have access to in the past. And now there's uh, almost this great excitement of, oh, finally we can get this, this oil. But not just that, also uh, the, the technological lust to put mirrors in space. There's so much money in that. And I remember being very moved. I saw Maud Barlow speak. She was uh, working for the UN on water issues. And she had made this point that we, um, the technologies that we could use to clean up spills or to prevent them are actually incredibly cheap. And that's par partially the problem of why we don't have them right now is because they're so cheap. And there's just so much desire to make money to, um, to use equipment that would be very expensive because there's so much money to make off of that. You mean there's so much more money to make off of cleaning up after the fact, after the damage is caused? Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, and also the kinds of technologies and equipments that we use. So using dispersants, which actually costs a lot of money, versus maybe uh, you know using uh, mushrooms, for instance, to, to to clean things up. So, is there a 
kind of policy conclusion that you would draw from this idea or this notion that there is an incentive to contaminate? I mean, what is there that uh, policymakers or the governments could, in theory, or also social movements could push for uh, in order to avoid uh, this kind of uh, incentive uh, to contaminate? Definitely, we don't, we don't have any kind of international structure for dealing with environmental violence of the kind that we're seeing in places like Ecuador. Uh, because of the fact that it, it's not treated as a war crime, even though most of us understand that there are wars over resources. As, and what happened in Ecuador was exactly that. It was the fight over, the, over resources. And there is a link between that kind of capital accumulation and conquest of, of the region and petroviolence. And so either we need to change our idea of what constitutes war or have some kind of international legal framework for almost uh, like a strict liability like we have sometimes in the national contexts. But beyond the, the legal realm, um, I also believe that we need to change our ideas about what we can even remediate. Because there's this idea that we can create all this destruction and have a Chernobyl in the Amazon and clean it up after the fact. Same with fracking, that we can pollute the water and then get this beautiful technology and then we'll have clean water. And so that also shapes how we build our policies around uh, contamination. Okay, great. Well, I was speaking with Lindsay Ofrias, a PhD candidate and in anthropology at Princeton University and the author of the article Invisible Harms, Invisible Profits, A Theory of the Incentive to Contaminate, published in the August issue of Culture Theory and Critique. Uh, thanks, Lindsay, for having joined me. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching The Real News Network.